Welcome to Press On Podcast with Mike Woodruff, where Mike and invited guests share insights to cultivate a biblical perspective and thoughtful resilience in challenging times. Uh, welcome to Press On. Today, I have a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Chris Dansky, uh, who I recently heard speak at the Henry Center. So uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School has uh, the Carl Henry Center. Carl Henry was a post-World War II theologian, uh, did many things, including serve as the uh, editor, the first editor for Christianity Today, when Billy Graham got that started. I uh, wrote lots of books, including this massive uh, six-volume God Revelation and Authority, which, uh, oh, there you go, yes. Uh, That's a yeah. Uh, many people have them. I won't ask you, Chris, if you've read them or not. Uh, I have not read them. Uh, but he wrote a lot of books and uh, he led organizations. He was a president at one point of the uh, ETS, the Evangelical Theological Society. But I think he's sort of uh, his key contribution, or at least one of the sort of signature contributions, was that he stood. In the, uh, in the gap between the fundamentalists who were taking a very uh, harsh view on modernity and rejecting uh, interaction with uh, the academy and other things. And he sort of stood between that group and the, uh, and the more mainline churches that were sort of acclimating and, and imbibing more of the modernist era and sort of carved out this space uh, for evangelicals. So the Henry Center at Trinity uh, exists to uh, seek to bridge the gap between the academy and the church by cultivating resources and communities that advance Christian wisdom. And because we, uh, because uh, Christ Church is close to Trinity, I have a chance to go to a lot of these events, and that always includes uh, lunch for the pastors afterwards with the presenter and. Chris was the presenter a couple of weeks ago, and he presented on the Ascension. So um, a brief bio of Dr. Gansky. He is the founding pastor of City Reformed Church in Milwaukee, which he founded in 2012, uh, and which is hard work. We'll talk about that in a second. Has a, BH, uh, a BA in philosophy and cultural theory from the University of Central Florida, uh, an MDiv at Princeton, and a PhD at from uh, Marquette. His bio, uh, his bio says that for a few years, he and his wife lived as intellectual vagabonds biking around Europe, studying at the University of Tübingen, Germany, and drinking coffee. Uh, taught theology at Yale for a couple of years, where his greatest contribution, according to his bio, again, is creating a legacy of home coffee roasting and espresso connoisseurship. So I am noticing a theme here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he has always kept one foot in the academy, um, but been a local church guy. So um, I, I sort of stand in that gap from the other side. So uh, my sense, and we'll sort of explore this, but as a college pastor, I was always uh, a local church guy trying to reach towards the university mm. and the academy. And, um, and then when I was the president of scholar leaders uh, for a dozen years, always sort of reaching towards the academy. So scholar leaders, again, that group that uh, affiliated with John Stott. And the idea was if uh, the church is God's plan, which I believe it is, then uh, one of the most important people in a church is going to be the pastor. And one of the key things is going to be the pastor's sermon and culture that gets created there. And so you, you ask the question, how do we best form pastors? And that comes down to uh, who is going to teach them and who is going to write the books that they read. And so Stott, early in his uh, career, he's obviously, he's passed away 10 years ago or so, but early in his life when he, he had already had sort of um, was writing books that were selling a lot, he was taking the royalties of his books to help men and women from Africa, Asia, Latin America get their PhD studies, provided they were going to serve as uh, professors and uh, presidents of, of uh, denominations and academic deans and others shaping the church by shaping the pastors. And so I've always sort of had, I've always sort of been standing in the local church reaching towards the academy and Chris sort of stands with one foot in the academy uh, also reaching 
to the church. And bridging that divide is um, not always easy. It can be deep and wide, and uh, some days deeper and wider than others. So Chris and his wife uh, have uh, two children, Tess and Van, and he grew up fishing and surfing, now into swimming, cooking, and gardening, and apparently, Chris, into coffee. Um, and I, I read with some interest and in, in heard you say that, you know, surfing sort of kept you sane during the last few years. Yeah. And I'm just a little confused by that because you're in Wisconsin. Um, so yeah. how do, do you, do you actually surf on Lake Michigan? I mean, what, what are you doing here? Yeah, no, I do surf on Lake, Lake Michigan and, uh, surfed on Lake Michigan on Saturday. In fact, <laughs> up okay. in Port Washington. Wow. <laughs> so is that do you, do you have a dry suit or do you have a wetsuit it's a wetsuit it's a thick wetsuit yeah oh my i would goodness. have surfed this morning but i had a 7 15 a.m elder meeting so i didn't have time to no, not enough daylight between sun sunrise and the beginning of that meeting to get out but well i've got to say given a choice between surfing in lake michigan in uh, february and going to an elder meeting i might actually take up surfing and we've got great elders, so I'm I'm not yeah, uh, not yeah. knocking them, but uh, no. I, I, one, go ahead. One surfing lesson when I was in Florida, and the guy before he would take me out, he says, "You got to watch these surfers. You got to tell me the most important rule of surfing." I mean, so literally, I I'm standing there for like 15 minutes watching these people, and he come over, he go, "You figured it out yet?" <laughs> and I'm going, "Ah, oh, it's balance, or you know, catching the right way." Or I, I go and throw all these things and. No, no, keep watching. So he'd go away. I, he finally comes back and I said, oh, I get it. The goal is to look cool at all times. So even like if you wipe out, you act like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, that's what I expected. I'm, I'm better than that. So <laughs> that's all I know about serving. By the way, I did read uh, a few years ago, I read the book called The Wave. Did you, have you read that by chance? <laughs> well, you might, you might enjoy it. So it's, um, it's just called the wave and it is every other chapter is about big wave surfers so the question oh. is how do you get these 100 foot waves and so they they alternate between people talking about them you know physicists explaining them insurance companies talking about ships that are taken out people that have survived the greatest waves of all time and then every other chapter is sort of on laird hamilton and what he's doing yeah. and it, it was it was fascinating so um yeah. i recommend it well let me just ask because you did say that uh that it had been a difficult few years for you as a church planner how, how are you doing i'm doing well now um yeah i mean i it's hard it's funny i don't think of myself as a church planner anymore i'm just a pastor um okay. we're not a church plan anymore we're a pretty established church um for 10 years now 11 years um, although we still have some of that startup entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit, hopefully Good. In, in our sense of mission and outreach. Um, but no, you know, the Lord is, has been really kind and faithful to kind of keep, keep me going in the ministry, um, going through the pandemic. And we had some difficult issues that came up right prior to the pandemic that kind of just really were magnified in the midst of it all that made it really difficult. So, um, yeah, I mean, I found the Lord sort of withheld. I've been, I've been in Milwaukee since 2005 and I've surfed my whole life for the most part, but I never occurred to me to surf the lake, even though I know people did, but I started to after some time off and, and it, yeah, it was really, God used it to really just kind of help me sort some, some stuff out just because it created some, some boundaries and it's something I love to do. And it's um, been a, a kind of a piece, you know, it's a, it's a soul restoring type of activity. Mm. For me. So, so yeah, it's been a great blessing that way. And, and now I'm, you know, there's not a huge, it's not like Florida or California, but uh, you know, there's a strong community of surfers here in the great lakes. And I'm pretty embedded now in that community and some good friends and, Lots of ministry opportunity too. So the surfing pastor, that's now my, you know, I've been, <laughs> I have a reputation. There's a, I'm pretty confident to say there's no other surfing pastors that I know of, at least on this side of great of the lake. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I can't imagine, but um, 
Good on you. Uh, so, yeah, and and how is it that you find yourself in Milwaukee as opposed to uh, you know I don't know Maui or someplace where you could um, surf yeah. and not be the only pastor? Well, cheaper. You, you did you heard you did your PhD in Milwaukee and then did yeah. you fall in yeah. love with the 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 cheese or the beer or the city or what what kept you in Milwaukee? I always joke that the, so the the story of John Calvin is, you know he you know, he had to flee from his hometown in France because of the persecution of the Protestants by the, 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 the Roman Catholic uh, royal court. <laughs> and uh, he was passing through, he wanted to go to Strasbourg and he passed through Geneva mm -hmm. and he kind of got hung and hung up in Geneva. He really wanted to be in Strasbourg. That was the place he wanted to be because it's uh, more French and um, he liked Spitzer and But, you know, he kind of ended up getting stuck in Geneva and left at one point but then was called back and he could never leave. And I kind of feel like that's a little bit my story. I, I wasn't planning on staying here, um, but the Lord hasn't let me go. Um, so here I am. And, you know, uh, it's been a good place to have, you know, to raise a family and my kids now, you know, I tease them sometimes, about, you know, us moving someplace and they just freak out. Um, <laughs> they don't want to leave. Well, so we, we've, yeah, we found a good place here in Milwaukee. So good. Our youth pastor uh, was only going to be here for a little while. He just, he just served, he just uh, finished his 25th year as the uh, student ministries guy here. So yes, uh, John Calvin is not alone in getting, uh, yeah. you know, got to go where the Lord says, right? Right. So um, you gave this talk, and I, I wanted to follow up with you. You spoke uh, at the Henry Center on the Ascension, uh, which is certainly an undeveloped doctrine in most Protestant churches. So perhaps we should start with an overview, and uh, I, I will just say, by by way of brief, as, briefly framing this in, so after Christ's death and resurrection, he has 40 days in which we're told that he uh, that he teaches the apostles and he explains how the scriptures point to them starting i think it says in the book of moses with the with the books of moses he explains how all the scripture is pointing to him and then at the end of that 40 days they then go uh, to the mount uh to mount olivet uh, near jerusalem and he sort of gives this final set of promises and commands and and then he um he ascends into heaven and so two passages it seems like luke is the the guy who writes about this uh i don't think we get it in the other gospels but in in uh, luke 24 it says and he led them out as far as bethany and lifting up his hands he blessed them and when he blessed them he parted from them and was carried up into heaven and then in Acts uh, chapter 1, so this book, uh, for those of you who don't remember, this book also written by Luke, he sort of continues the gospel of Luke. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, um, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he lit, was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and then uh, said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So uh, my not very developed uh, Protestant understanding of the ascension is that, um, is that it, it is when Jesus rises physically uh, in his new first fruits resurrection body, rises into heaven the angels, the disciples watch when, when he's into heaven, the, the angels say, okay, guys, you know, show's over, get, get to work. You've been given an assignment to do. And we note that this is uh, significant because it means the, that Christ's earthly ministry is drawn to an end, that he is physically in heaven. He's at the right hand of the father where he's serving as our high priest interceding for us. And uh, uh, sort of the next thing up is in one sense and in terms of you know cosmic redemptive history the next thing is the judgment and christ to christ return so did did you study the ascension i mean was your dissertation about the ascension or some aspect of the ascension so 
how do you know about the ascension and what am I leaving out? No, I, my, <clears throat> my work on the ascension is uh, kind of after my PhD, but it sort of flows out of it a little bit because ascension becomes a, in the reform tradition, which is my tradition, um, it becomes a, a really important theme um, in debates with the Lutherans over the nature of the presence of Christ in the supper. And uh, the reformed would, uh, would always say, you know, but his body is in heaven. And so you can't say his body is on the altar. Um, so, so it gets really kind of um, high level in terms of the, the nature. But I, I do think that the, the effect of those debates and that emphasis, I just sort of attuned one from within a tradition to certain themes. So I've always been very attentive to the role that Ascension plays. Uh, but there was one book in particular that really kind of reformatted. And I, and I think that word reformatted is, is, a, is probably the best one, um, my understanding and filled it out, which is a book by Douglas Farrow called Ascension and Ecclesia. And it's an academic book. It's not an easy book to read, but it's it's a really profound work. And I think that sort of opened up for me a whole lot of things. And, and that you think about the ascension and um, it is a difficult doctrine. And I would say it's not just Protestants that have an underdeveloped doctrine of the ascension. Most, most Christian traditions do. I mean, I think Catholics, Orthodox and Anglicans, because they have a liturgical calendar that marks the ascension, um, as part of their worship on a yearly basis, it, it will always come up, right? And that's where, but I wouldn't say that those traditions necessarily have- Understand a deeper, what's going on. Yeah, or, or put it into practice. In some ways, I think that their worship reflects some of the Ascension themes a little bit more. And that's what you see in historic worship is um, the Ascension largely is, is, goes into a certain eclipse almost within, I think, certain Protestant traditions. Um, but so, yeah, the Ascension really kind of grows out of even my, my own, um, as I was planning a church, City, City Reform Church, um, 10 years ago, I was reading lots of uh, literature and material on mission and missional church and how to do church. And, and I was a bit frustrated by some of the ways that um, people would talk about the church or talk against the church. And and just some of the theological language that was used that I just thought, well, this isn't really actually how the New Testament talks about mission. It doesn't use these categories. It uses this category. And so I, I've just been for 10 years now, really, um, you know, working out of this, this framework and kind of meditating and reflecting on it. I mean, there's so, one theologian. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I, first of all, I, I will say that I remember being, um, I don't know if it was shocked or embarrassed when somebody, you know, says to me, it's Ascension Day. And I'm like, what in the world is that? Like, I've never, I've never heard of it or thought of it. And then, you know, you go, oh, okay, yeah, Christ ascended. And so this must be 40 days after Easter. I suppose I should know this. Are we supposed to do something? I, I, I'm like, yeah, I, I mean, I sort of don't have much of a... Well, my church background so i'm a little embarrassed going okay i'm yeah. i'm caught exposed here but um as i asked around i thought i'm not hearing somebody explain to me why i should care so part of what got my attention mm -hmm. at this henry lecture as you said uh you know the ascension should shape our our mission our the way that the way the church thinks about the church mm -hmm. and its mission more than the great uh, than the Great Commission. And I, I think you said that. And I was like, oh wow, I don't even I don't even know how that would be. So I, yeah. So you're saying, and just just to tease this out to back up, so you said uh, ascension and ecclesia. So ecclesia for those who uh, are are not Greek scholars uh, or pseudo Greek scholars, uh, ecclesia is the is the Greek word for church. So ecclesiology is the study of the church. So so uh, ascension and the church, and trying to figure out the interaction here, the importance of the ascension to the church, and how the church, which again is is uh, the bride of Christ, it's us. It is. Uh, and by the way, you also said. <laughs> 
I'm not going to say it because you said not to say it. Um, <laughs> and it also got my attention. I have heard it said uh, the 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 church. It's not so much that the church has a mission. It's that the mission of God has a church to carry yeah. out its mission. And you were sort of pushing back on that. So yeah. I guess I'm I'm looking for you. Yeah. Here's your opportunity. Tell me, tell those of us listening why we should care. Uh -huh. What difference it makes that as opposed to saying so, somehow, because I'm guessing most people are like, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. And then they they sort of stopped thinking there. So it's not like, oh, he's back down on earth. And then he went back to heaven. And that was like a one time event. And it was a big signature event. I need to think about that. So just, I think it's all undeveloped. Why yeah. does it matter that Christ ascended 40 days after the resurrection? Well, let me give you, this is where, you know, in the Reformed tradition, I want to just read one. So in the Heidelberg Catechism, which was written in 1565 or so, Reformed Catechism, there's a question and answer in here. It says, there's actually four questions on ascension, but the one question and answer 49 is, how does Christ's ascension to heaven benefit us? That's the question. And, the, and it gives three different reasons. First, he's our advocate in heaven in the presence of the Father, right? Second, we have our own flesh in heaven as a sure pledge that Christ, our head, will also take us, his members, up to himself, right? And then third, he sends his spirit to us on earth as a corresponding pledge and by the Spirit's power, we seek not earthly things, but the things above where the Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So, so you have the, there's three, for, just from the perspective of, of the Heidelberg Catechism, and this is reflected in other confessions as well, is that he's our advocate. You know, he's constantly interceding for us. This is Jesus's ministry that becomes clear in the book of Hebrews. Um, he's also... There's the promise that someday we will be with him and we will be like him, right? That there's that that sense that he's taken redeemed humanity into the presence of God, which means that someday we will also be able to, to be there with God. And then third, it's just that Pentecost and the gift of the spirit depends upon Jesus is going into heaven. I mean, he makes that really clear at numerous points in his ministry. Yeah. So those are those are the three classical understandings. And I've sort of built around that a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, I preached this past weekend on John uh, 14. And Jesus saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to die. He seems to finally get their attention uh, that he's going to die. And then he says, don't panic. I'm going ahead to prepare a place for you. And I will send uh, the advocate, the comforter, I will send um, send to you. Okay, well, um, I want to um, maybe I want to reserve the right to come back to this, but um, explain explain how that is shaping. How does how does the ascended Christ mm -hmm. shape your work as a church planner? So you're thinking through: we're starting a church. I get to do whatever I jolly well want to do, and not do what I don't want to do. I mean, within reason, uh, this is, you know, you're standing in a 2000 uh, year tradition, yeah, yeah. but how does the ascension of Christ, how did that shape your understanding of the mission of city reform? Yeah. Well, let me, let me back up just a little bit and try to fill out some of the questions you had asked earlier. And I think this will lead into the question you just asked. So I want to come back to the question you raised about mission being connected more to ascension than commandment. And I don't know if I would phrase it. That's not how I meant I would phrase it. Um, but what's clear here is that the commands, the, the Great Commission commands, are, are set against the backdrop of Jesus's uh, resurrection and ascension, that, that it's the reality of his exaltation. And what that means and accomplishes that makes mission possible. So the command to go and make disciples of all nations really flows out of what his exaltation achieves and makes possible. Without his resurrection and without his ascension into heaven, the command for mission would not be possible. 
And so what I, what I was trying to show in my lecture is how, how those are interconnected and what it, what that, why that's important is that it, it expands mission beyond the, this really kind of narrow, like, well, we got to do this part of the, the task, you know, like mission has a cosmic, a cosmic, like focus, like it's, it is cosmological in it, in its scope and its significance. It's part of how the church as a distinct humanity in the world participates in salvation history and becomes part of the redemption and of new creation, right? So it, it's just so much bigger than just like, oh, well, Jesus told us we got to go and share the gospel. Like, yeah, but it's like so much bigger than that. So part of it is just having an expanded vision that's more majestic, more more weighty, um, that, that you can also see within the framework of, of salvation history rather than just world history. And I, I think that part of the problem of the church today is that when we think about mission and we think about the church struggling um, in various places, we can sometimes just let American history or our, our specific histories as denominations to be this these blinders in which we, we only think in terms of, and we can't see the bigger picture of what God is doing and how we fit into that. And, and we can easily get overwhelmed and discouraged because we're not seeing history from above. Sure. Sure. And so, so that's, that's one thing I would say is just I, how I put, so here's how, let me give you a metaphor that might help cinch things a little bit. So you asked a question, um, about, well, what difference does this make for how you do ministry, how you think about mission? I would, I would explain it like this. Ascension, the ascension of Christ is something like the operating system um, for the mission and ministries of the church in the New Testament. So if you think about an operating system, right? Um, you know, it's, you know, it's usually going to be Mac based or, or Android based or, you know, Microsoft or Apple or whatever, right? An operating system and you have an operating system and then you have various applications and softwares that run off of that operating system, right? And the problem is like when you try to run an app, an Apple app that doesn't, you know, on a Android platform generally doesn't work unless there's some kind of compatibility. Right. And so now most of the time, most of the time, users like us as users of, of, of smartphones or computers are never dealing with the operating system, except when we do an update or something, right? But we don't, we don't kind of look behind and see all the ones and zeros and all the code. Um, and nevertheless, all that really complex, sophisticated code, you know, we, when it runs well, gives us, you know, we run these different applications efficiently and effectively. And to a certain extent, there's something about like that, what I'm saying here about the way that the ascension of Christ functions, it's sort of like the operating system of the ministry of the church. Um, it is the ongoing, like if you read Ephesians and you read Hebrews and Colossians and really all through the New Testament, the perspective is that Jesus, the ministry of the church is an extension of Jesus's heavenly ministry on earth. And that he is the ascended Lord and that he is in a sense running the church from heaven through his spirit. And the orientation of the church, as say for Colossians says, set your mind on things above, or Ephesians talks about, you know, um, all things growing up into Christ's head, right? There's always this heavenly ascent aspect to the ministry, a heavenly, heavenly orientation that's really essential to how we think about the ministry of the church. And so, I mean, just everywhere, when you know what you're looking for, it's everywhere. And so part of the challenge of this is trying to make sense of it. Well, okay, so how does this how does this change how we do ministry? Yeah. Okay, so let me let me leverage something you just said because uh, it seemed to be a handle um, talking about uh, having a cosmic view of this and a and a grand view of God operating this and uh, from heaven and a call to be heavenly minded. Yeah, uh, Paul's call in Ephesians in particular. So how do you cultivate a eternal perspective? How do you how do you help other people have this more of a um, of a cosmic, um, you know, 
uh, teleological. Well, I, I won't. I won't go there. How do you a, a cosmic, uh, settled sense of God's in control? I've read the end of the book, and yep. uh, I'm I'm operating. I'm operating out of an operating system that says um, God wins. Jesus is in heaven. He's seated. He's my advocate. He's got this. Um, I am I am his representative on earth, and I I shouldn't worry even if um, it looks like we're losing at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of things there. Uh, let me just give you to be as concrete as possible. So, okay. uh, so one thing is, I think our worship needs to be heavenly in its orientation. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, part of being heavenly is not to be clear. And just for the listeners, heaven, don't think when you think of heaven, you hear the language of heaven in the Bible. Don't think of some spiritualized immaterial place. Heaven is a created place. It's part of the creation. But it's that part of creation where God dwells perfectly, where there's no strife or conflict. Right. So. So Jesus is exalted actually above the heavens, right? So that means that he goes even beyond the heavens. Uh, he, I mean, he's over all of it, right? There's not a sense where he's the head in the heavens. No, he's, he's above it all. But heaven is the place where, all, where created things are completely and fully alive in the presence and love of God. And, and that at the end of history, when Jesus does come again, heaven and earth will meet. They, they will be rejoined. See, they were joined at one point. But but after the fall, they were disconnected, right? And so so the heavenly, when we think about heaven, don't think of a different place necessarily. That's but it's it's a it's a different time. It's the it's a it's a, it's a place where God is all in all, right? Yeah. And someday that will be reflected throughout all creation when heaven and earth are reunited. And yeah. so when we think about heaven, it's it's there's so many different ways that it's so. It's the dwelling place of God. It is um, it is the source of hope for us as well. This is where, I mean, shepherding people, especially through illness and sickness and death, like heaven is, you know, sometimes this is the only time we appeal to heaven. Well, you know, you'll see them again when they're in heaven. Well, that, that is a great comfort if people are in Christ. Um, but this idea that somehow one of the big great challenges from a, from a discipleship perspective, how do how do we help create longings for heaven that actually exceed our greatest hopes and longings for like the things of this world, which aren't necessarily bad, but like when when my only hope is just an eminent hope, which is like, man, I hope I can get that vacation home up north, or man, I hope, you know, whatever, fill in whatever it is, that perfect relationship or family or job or promotion that we put all our hope in but the hope in heaven is to put one's hope fully and completely in god to realize that god is is the highest thing we are created for and can ever be united with this is what in the christian tradition is called the beatific vision which is when someday at the end of life when i will be when we see him we will be like him yep. so so that's that's a that's such an important part of it, it heaven keeps christian faith god-centered <laughs> i mean it's so easy for us to become uh i don't know christianized in a very this worldly way and um that heavenly dimension is to say no the most important thing about you as a human being your fundamental most important relationship is your relationship with god this is and this keeps then evangelism <laughs> a really center to to the to the life right. and the mission of the, the mission. church right Right, because if, if if at the end of the day, like we're not really care, we don't really care what happens to people when they die, well then we should just focus on like improving their life now, here and now. And 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 again, I'm not I don't think the mission of the church is 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 against that, but but again, like all this is gonna pass. You know, as Paul says in in First Corinthians 7, right? The forms of this world are passing away, right? And so teaching people to live in that radical transition phase of, of like, it's very hard for us to do in our culture. Um, but, but it's, I think it's really important. And this is part of that heavenly dimension of our ministry. That, those, so those are a few things I could add a lot more. Well, but I'll let you respond. Well, 
I do think that, um, yeah, I, I have, I appreciate in Peter Kreef's book, everything you always want to know about heaven, but we're afraid to ask. He starts by saying, I've capitalized the H in heaven to emphasize the point that it's, um, that it's real. As a matter of fact, it's more real than um, Peoria and Chicago, because in 10,000 years, there will be no Peoria or Chicago, but there still will be heaven. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I've, I've tried to, you know, emphasize this idea that, um, look, it's not this mystical, magical, ethereal, spiritual, vaporous, you know, never, never land. That's not, yeah. It's not what we get here. We, and I do think the poverty of human language prevents John in his uh, revelation and uh, Paul in, in what, Second Corinthians, I think, uh, from being able to say much about heaven. But I do think this idea that we've got to be thinking more about heaven and eternity and Christ in heaven and I'm living in... I'm living in in two cities, but my citizenship is primarily in heaven. Yeah, yeah. Go to Augustine. We've got to we've got to be embracing that. I find it very hard to do myself. It is an ongoing challenge to be reminded that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, this life is short. Uh, eternity is not. The opportunity is today. I need to be faithful today and not be um, discouraged or um, whatever. Well, yeah. so I'm going to, um, again, reserving the right to, to double back on this, but uh, yeah. our time is getting away. Um, you talked uh, about Daniel being an important book to you. Yeah. And uh, I wondered why that was. I mean, obviously, there's some of this uh, how to live faithfully um, in exile kind of stuff that you might have been going to. You mentioned a little bit about the whole son of man, son of God debate, um, Daniel 7. I just I just was curious, what what led you to Daniel? And then I want to drill down on Daniel 7. Well, primarily the ascension themes. I, I make I make the the argument in my my talk that in in um in Luke's presentation of the ascension, we have a a, a below the clouds view, an account of the ascension. But in Daniel's account in chapter seven, we have an above the clouds view, right? So it's the same event they're talking about, but one is one is less glorious and mysterious. That's the disciples looking up and just Jesus disappears into the clouds. And, and the way we experience um, the ascension of Christ uh, as, as with, you know, on our earthly pilgrimage is below the clouds, right? We don't yep. see the glory. We, we, the clouds blocks our view for, of heaven. But Daniel has this prophetic vision of the son of man enthroned next to the ancient of days yep. in which all the nations, tribes and languages are fall down and worship and gather around him. And so that's the reality that exists now in heaven. And, and that's sort of like the mission through the, the, the spirit at Pentecost is sort of bringing that heavenly reality down through, to earth through the mission and life of the church. Right. Let me, let me read some, that just so that people, um, Daniel yeah. 7, 13, yeah. in my vision, so this is Daniel, the, he's just described this vision, you've had, um, um, yeah. and then in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days, that would be God the Father, he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples in every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So I mentioned, again, for those um, from Christ Church who are listening, I mentioned the last, I think, two weeks ago, talked a little bit about Jesus using this phrase son of man to describe himself. It's the, it's the way he talks about himself. Yep. It seems to the, uh, to the uninformed, like a very humble thing as opposed to claiming to be son of God. But the religious leaders who understand this reference to Daniel seven are uh, apoplectic. They, uh, they, they understand that it's this incredible claim. So, uh, so I guess I would, you, you mentioned the son of man, son of uh, God debates, and you said you didn't want to go there. Yeah. Um, can you go there for 30 seconds? <laughs> well, it's just a son of man debate. It's not a son of God debate. Uh, so son of man, it's just the debate. There's a couple uh, big 
issues, right? So Daniel seems to be the first place in, in the Hebrew tradition where this, this phrase son of man comes up. And in Daniel, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have the, at this point, uh, the character of an official title. It simply means one like a human, right? Um, but later in what's called the second temple tradition, Daniel, of course, is a really key book. And you have these other books, the Enoch, and um, also the book of Ezekiel uses son of man language, but in more in the way that's like humble, like, like one born of a human. Um, but the son of man is this mysterious figure in Daniel, and it becomes this very mysterious figure in, in the second temple tradition. And the debates amongst New Testament scholars in particular have to do with how, what does Jesus really mean? when he claims, and what's unique about, what's unique about the title is that nobody ascribes to Jesus the title son of man, except Jesus himself. The right. only, yeah. the only time is actually an acts with Stephen, where he says, I saw the son of man, right? But, but Jesus has already ascended, right? This is, he's seen the ascended Lord um, in, in, in the Daniel seven sense. So and perhaps important in that context, because uh, something I think people are sometimes surprised to hear is that Jesus remains the son of man. He remains yeah. fully human in heaven. Yeah, he doesn't cast off his 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 humanity. Now that I'm done with that, I'm going to throw right. it aside. No, right. Which would be a very um, platonic kind of thing to do. The body is right. bad. I've got to shed it. And no, that's yeah. that's that's. That's Plato, not Paul. Uh, yeah. That's that we can move move past. Yeah. So, and by the way, just uh, reference um, my interpretive role here. Second Temple period. So the first yeah. Temple is built by Solomon. It's of course destroyed in five eighty six. Um, do I have yeah. that right? Five eighty seven. Yeah, I'm not going to get the dates right for it. Okay, <laughs> but somewhere around uh, there. Yeah. So 722 is when the Assyrians come. I think I think you know the other date I remember from all the all that grad school history stuff I had to take was 586 or 587 is when the southern uh two tribes of uh you know of the, Jerusalem falls to the Babylonians and it's destroyed. And so then you go this whole period where there is no temple during the exile and then they start to rebuild the temple and initially that second temple is is rebuilt when at the tail end of uh you know you got nehemiah rebuilding the wall and you you start that but then you've got the second temple with uh herod the great he just builds on that temple so when you're so, saying second temple period do you want to give a time frame for that yeah so basically what the the language of second temple literature refers to um writings that are that are really subsequent to kind of the closing of what we consider now the old testament canon okay. so now there's some might be some overlap but there's a whole bunch of books that within catholic bibles you'll find um you know these stories uh, wisdom of solomon you know or um book of susanna you know enoch the maccabees Yep. All this is considered Second Temple. And what's so important to understand about it the is... The apocryphal books. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So this is the Second Temple period. And it just it's really just associated with the beginning. I forget the exact dates of, the, of that Second Temple. And, yeah. and it's a 400-year period, though, of literature where we don't have any canonical books that are part of the finished Bible. But, but, but all the New Testament writers and all the rabbis and all the... And Jesus himself would have been living sort of like, you know, today, right? We, we read you know, Tim Keller or we read, you know, uh, whatever popular, yep. whatever popular C. You know, Lewis. Christian author. And we don't, yep. yeah, C.S. Lewis or Tolkien, we don't see these as inspired, but they're very influential in how we, yep. how we process and interpret. And so in the, there's all this literature. And, and so Son of Man as a category gets really developed as a title during this 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 time period okay. and daniel's way way in the background but it gets really developed and so the real debate going back to our original question we can move on is simply that new testament scholars are sometimes like well when jesus is referring to himself as the son of man does he have daniel in mind or is mm -hmm. it the enoch tradition you know okay. and the watchers and and so like it gets so really really obscure and arcane so um, I, I i listened to this podcast uh and and it's a 
political podcast and the uh the commentator when when he fears he's going beyond what people are interested in he calls it rank punditry so i i fear <laughs> i'm going to be accused of rank theology here when i i'm asking you questions about the second temple period but well, thank you, you. Know, I, it, you know let me just make a, a go back to something real quick i want to just mention this because this this gets back to i think one of your your vision mike and i think i would share of being a bridge between the academy and in in the church um so i i'm an academic and um i've i've had more of a foot for the past 10 years in the local church than i have in the academy and that's been good for me because it's helped me detox from things that are not always helpful um but with that said you know i think part of it is understanding like you know these ideas do matter actually these debates even though really obscure and arcane they really do matter however i always like to use it in terms of a medical like med medical analogy, like when I meet people who are studying for ministry or, or if I'm teaching or, and there, there tends to be an American, especially evangelicalism, a very kind of democratized understanding of religion to where the learned pastor is something like, oh, you know, the learned pastor. And, you know, I was, I went through a church plan evaluation in which through my denomination and they, they, it was a mark against me that I had a PhD. Right. Because, well, you're not going to be able to relate and connect. And, you know, there's certain truths to that. I mean, if you're just forming in those ways, but there's an anti-intellectualism that I think is is counterproductive to to the, the needs of the gospel and the mission. But here's how to understand it, though. There are, there are times in which it's like when we go to the doctor, most of us at least, it's like we are the heart surgeon. We don't think twice that the heart surgeon actually spent 15 years to get to the point to where we're comfortable with him cutting open our chest and right. doing a double bypass. The fact that he had to learn anatomy at a level and apprentice at a level of sophistication where he would, he couldn't even explain to us. We couldn't even begin to understand the complexity there, but we, none of us are, none of us have any doubt that it's really important when we're on the operating table. Why is theology and the, and, and the word of God any different? Why, why do we want the math of the architect that builds the bridges we drive over to be absolutely um, on point, where we're kind of like, eh, you know, theological ideas, you know, everybody has them. No, right. I mean, if it's, we're talking about the truth of God, it's saying, but it's not for everybody, right? Like, I'm the guy who, in a sense, am more in the heart surgeon mode, where like, I, that's the level at which I was trained, and that's the level at which I can think. But I've actually had to learn to be a practitioner. And so there is a way that I can uniquely kind of go up and down the ladder a little bit. Well, and and God bless you for that. And I do, I I absolutely agree. I think that when I was spending 12 years trying to raise money for people to do PhDs in theology, I said, look, um, I get that some people, they're never going to support this because this is like, oh my goodness, there's kids starving all over the world and we're going to pay for some, you know, somebody to sit in a library and read old books. Right. Right. Uh, I can't do that. I said, yeah, you know, I, I get that. I don't want to talk you out of supporting the kids that are starving. But uh, at the same time, the, I, we, we just said there's, there's four levels of training. So for every hundred new Christians in an area, we need to train somebody who yep. can do basic follow-up and discipleship and point somebody to a church. And for every thousand new Christians in an area, we need um, uh, we need somebody who's going to pastor a church, and ideally, they have a lot more training than the person who's doing just the basics. Right. And then for every hundred thousand people in an area, you need somebody who's going to pastor pastors and going to yep. going to keep their eye out on what's going on and be alert to some of the broader themes that are developing. Uh, and you want them to have even more training and experience. And then for every one million new Christians in an area, you need a thought and opinion leader. You need somebody that's going to be able to. Yep. write books and lead institutions. And it's not that the level four leader is more important than the level one leader. Uh, don't believe that, but, but it does require a different kind of training and different gifts. And what we need out of level four leaders mm -hmm. is a big heart and a big mind. And yep. sometimes you get just the big mind without the big heart. And you say, look, yep. given a choice between a big mind and a small heart or a, uh, a small mind and a big heart, I, that's a hard call for me to make. And I probably go with a big heart and a small mind, but yeah. th that's a false binary. We don't have to yeah. take that. 
Like nope. we want both. And so, well, best, yes. And I love that. Things, these things filter down over time. The ideas that, that are being discussed in the Academy, uh, we're seeing that today. You know, the, the ideas of the Academy 10 years ago were playing out in, in culture and in HR departments and in all kinds of different ways. And so we need to be alert to these. Okay. Yeah, I, love, um, I like that, that image. And I would say that the best four level four leaders um, are those who kind of started at level one and two <laughs> yeah, and, right. and worked their way up and have spent the time with people shepherding and pastoring. Right. And you can be a level, you can have a PhD and not be a level four leader and you yeah. can be a level four leader without a PhD. It's just, was, exactly. for us, Absolutely. it was just Amen. the easiest equation to say, this is what we're trying to do. Yep. Okay. A um, couple, couple last questions before our lightning round here. Um, you had a couple quotes that I wrote down uh, from yep. your presentation. One of them, cultural transformation is not the goal of mission, but it is the fruit. Mm. Yep. You want to say something about that? Yeah. I mean, I just, I think um, understanding how culture transformation fits within how we think and talk about mission is really important. I think it's a mistake to make it the object of mission because then, you know, we're, we're, we can easily then become very worldly in the way we think about how, how mission works, right? Because it's like having influence and gaining influence and, and being persuasive um, in terms of the world. And I think, and again, I'm not against strategizing and being smart and Right. and all that but but the gospel it's always a miracle <laughs> when somebody becomes yep. a christian it always requires as paul says you know spiritual weapons and and spiritual realities and and you can't you know culture transformation is is again it's the fruit and it's never permanent like right like it's never permanent you know so we said uh, stott and then keller both have commented on this in different ways but We've said that our, our goal for the first 15 years that I was here at Christ Church, we said our, our, our goal, our mission is to proclaim the good news and engage in good works. They said it's both of those, but they're, the order is important. Yes. And the order is important in part because the church is the only one that's proclaiming the good news. There's lots of people trying to feed the sick and, and provide yes. medicine. God bless them. But the church is the only one doing that. I said, secondly, if you want more people to care for the poor and and uh and and feed the poor and care for the sick share the gospel because it right. it 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 ramps that up and the other doesn't necessarily follow so yeah yeah um well i just like that i also wrote down discipleship is humanization it is about becoming fully human and yeah. I, I think it's it sounded like a dallas willard kind of comment i didn't know where you got it or if you even knew you said it but i i thought it was an important no I, i'm pretty intentional about this language and it, it pops up and it's not necessarily uniquely anybody i mean it's not necessarily a common way that at least in evangelical circles it's talked about but you know in later in april kelly Capek, the last scripture right ministry lecture he i think his his theme will be on this on humanization, um, something about discipleship. Making humans. Go, go, therefore, and make humans. Yes. Um, he's got an excellent book along these lines that recently came out. Um, I'm for blanking on the title, but it, okay. it's beautiful. It's a wonderful book. Um, actually, it's right over here. Let me grab it real quick. Sorry, I forgot it. Um, but that theme of hum human, um, yeah, that theme of humanization, I think, is... is um, an interesting one to set in juxtaposition to the heavenly focus, because sometimes we think, well, to be heavenly and heavenly minded is to be not earthly, not physical, not human, more angelic, more spiritual. And again, these are, you know, you mentioned the platonic ways of thinking sometimes that, that, you know, um, to be spiritual is not necessarily to be not fleshly or physical. Right. It's for God to embody fully <laughs> the reality of physicality, if you will. Um, so humanization, I mean, what is Jesus doing, right? Like he goes into heaven and he takes his, our humanity with him into the presence of God. So now human, here you have humanity dwelling perfectly in the presence of God. And 
what what is discipleship except becoming like Jesus, who was the only true and full human being that ever existed, right? Like he is the most human human there ever was because he right. was obedient. And right. so that's that's yeah. when we see him, we will be like him. That's the goal. Yeah. And so like I think there is this this narrative in our culture which sees Christianity and sometimes Christians feed into this is anti-human or um, you know anti-physical or anti-world. Yeah. And that's, that's not, I mean, actually, no, to, to be Christian and to be in Jesus and to be like him is to be more human than, than, than is what human beings are meant to be. And so right. I think sin, that sin that is re- ultimately stupid and self-destructive and, and damaged good at best. And, and it makes us less, not more than, uh, less exactly. human, not more human. Yeah. I mean, exactly. it, and of course you see all that kind of imagery now that I, you mentioned Tolkien, I, I hadn't been thinking about him, but all the yeah, you know, Gollum being this, you know, he becomes lost, an animal. This, 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 you know, again, vacuous hobbit who's sort of lost all his uh, humanity, if that's what hobbits have. Um, okay, so um, we're we're bumping up against time here. So I have three quick questions. What are you reading right now? <laughs> uh, let's see. I, I've been doing a series on forgiveness. Um, and so I've been reading a lot of books on forgiveness, but one of the books I've been reading, and it's not directly about forgiveness, is uh, Wendell Berry's most recent book, mm. The Need to Be Whole. So in that book, he has a, a long chapter on, on forgiveness where he's looking about social forgiveness and you know the need to be to have, he calls it prepaid forgiveness as a society towards one another. Mm. So that's a really, that's a book that will make everybody mad from the right to the left, because he talks a lot about race issues and monuments and all the debates. And he's just very, very perceptive um, book. So that's a book. And then um, this is an older book, but Desmond Tutu's book, No No Future Without Forgiveness, is a book that I was reading last week and prep for a sermon where I was. Um, and I, is this, Desmond is this Tutu, the one he wrote with his daughter? I don't think so. I think um, I think it's just the okay. one his own but it tells the story of the truth and reconciliation committee in in south africa post-apartheid and just how deeply christian that process was and and you know uh, you know thinking about the mission of the church one of the things that i've been coming back to in my sermon series but is a, a main theme of of the mission vision of our church is that you know the great calling of the church in the world is is to bear witness to embody the forgiveness of sins in our lives, both as those who have received it personally, but as being a community of forgiveness in the world. And so I I think that- that, Especially in a cancel culture where where people are starting to see what it looks like when there is no forgiveness. You know, I I wrote those two books down um, and I'm assuming you picked up Keller's book on forgiveness, which I have not read. Yeah, I read that too. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you're, you know, I'm, I am uh, much older than you are. I'm, I'm not thinking about surfing anymore, like, <laughs> except in heaven. Uh, yes. I do now say, you know, in heaven, I'm going to do this. And in heaven, I'm going to do that. Um, I started, uh, and I'm not sure when this started, but uh, a while ago, I, it occurred to me that if I go another 10 years, um, and I preach 42 times a year, uh, if I go another 10 years and I probably will start to phase that out a little bit. I got 400 sermons left. Mm. And yep. that quickly led me to say two things. One is, well, I'm not preaching on that. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm done preaching on whatever that topic is. It's like, that's not one of the 400 messages that I want to make. Yeah. But the other is there's a couple where I go, I've got to get to this. And I have not done an extended series on forgiveness and I've yeah. sort of said that's coming up. Uh, and Wendell Berry, I'm in a book club. We're reading, um, uh, we're reading Lights Out, which is the story of GE, um, the transition from Jack Welch to Jeff Immelet. And it's, um, and it's all pretty much, it's all business people. Not, there's another pastor in this group. It's a community group, but it's mostly all business people in this group. Uh, and it's it's very disappointing, but it's not surprising to see what kind of chaos there was at uh, yeah. what kind of chaos there was at GE, and part of this, and part of it is you come away, you go, 
it's just too big. And uh, yeah. it just, it's just too big. And that led me to think of Wendell Berry's critique. Cause I find myself often looking at some of the problems in the world and go, the world's just too big right now. I, I mean, how can I affect change? We've let these economies become global. And whereas, you, you know, in a, I mean, you know, obviously Barry's a little bit of a, uh, a Luddite <laughs> in some ways, and I'm not yep. going to say, but, but there are times when I come back and I, I think Wendell, ba I think Wendell Barry's right about this one. Um, yep. I think some of these things are just too big and some of his perceptions are disturbing. So, um, I've written that down. Okay, next question in the lightning round because we're a, that was not a very lightning answer on on either of our parts. Sorry. Okay, I'll do better. What book have you been recommending the most in the last year? Not the Bible. You can't say the Bible. Um, two books. One I mentioned in our group is um, "Grounded in Heaven." Yep, I bought that on your recommendation, by the way. Yep, "Grounded in Heaven." At lunch. By Michael Allen. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, educated lay level. It's, Did he write a know, book on the Trinity? If, if I got that. I don't know. Uh, he okay. might have. I don't. Yeah. Okay. And the other book, and this is from a couple of years ago, but it was, it, it was a really important book for me. Um, it, it was a very healing book for me to work through some stuff, but just called with God in Russia. And it's with God it's the, and Russia with God in Russia. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's a book about, um, a Jesuit priest, um, named father Shizek, Shizek, who in the 1930s, before the outbreak of world war II, um, he's, he grew up in Pennsylvania, Polish. Uh, he wants to be a missionary in Russia. He goes through all of his training. He goes to Rome. He, he goes to Poland, the war breaks out. He ends up sneaking across the lines and um, has found out and uh, is imprisoned. And, and he's imprisoned for like 30 years and, and moved around various camps in Siberia. And uh, it's a very powerful story because in, <laughs> um, he, he, he ended up becoming a missionary to Russia, but not on his terms. Hmm. And and what what's beautiful about the book is, is there's not a lot of commentary in terms of like theologizing and spiritualizing. He just kind of he has this incredible recall memory, and so it's it's a beautiful book. This is um, okay. I highly recommend this. Spell uh, his last name. Uh, um, Walter Shizek. So uh, C I S Z E K. Okay. This is a book that's been around for a while. It was published in the '80s, but. That's okay. a book I've re recommended to a couple of people who are, especially ministry or people who have really given their lives to hard things and, and been disappointed and hurt and, and just need to reframe. <laughs> How it. is God with me, you know? Okay. Yeah. Great. And then uh, last question. Oh, what are you, what are you working on now? Are you writing something? Are you? Yeah. Yeah. So, so right now I'm, I'm the project Ascension week somebody invited me to come and do a um a retreat with a group of 20 25 pastors in the pca um and i'll have two different talks related to this material on ascension where i'm working out a couple of the different ideas and trying to apply it to church life and pastors and ministry so uh, my hope is to is to work towards a book in in, in you know eventually willing uh, so that's that's kind of what I'm, you know, non-church related. Uh, <laughs> got a whole bunch of church projects I'm working on. Uh, yeah. But but, that, but that's that's the yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, Chris, thank you for giving us uh, of your time so generously. Thanks for your work for the Henry Center. And uh, if I'm ever skiing on Lake Michigan, I will look for you. <laughs> yeah. Don't count on it. But <laughs> probably won't. If you're skiing, I probably won't be surfing. Surfing, be okay. Surfing, sir. <laughs> I, yeah, I meant surfing. Uh, oh, okay. If I'm ever surfing on Lake Michigan, or if oh, I sure, see yeah. anybody surfing with a, I don't know, there you wear you a go. collar when you're surfing, I, I will know that I uh, it's you. Okay. Just a wetsuit. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it.